The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. All right, so to today we're going to have a review of the visual and ocular motor systems that I had covered so far. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over many, many basic facts uh, in a rather quick fashion, uh, which will sort of refresh your memory of what we had covered so far, and also will make you more aware of uh, what you want to look at carefully when you look at the uh, uh, material on the uh, website on Stellar, and also uh, when you read uh, the assigned readings. Now I want to remind all of you again that you will have to put together that paper on the accessory optic system that I will mention very briefly at the end of the review. Uh, and your prime task there will be that's an old paper published in the 1960s, uh, which was a major discovery at the time. And your task will be predominantly to say what, well, first of all, what has been discovered there that you can cover in a paragraph, and then to add to it what people had contributed uh, to the study of that area since that uh, original paper. All right, so anyway. Um, then I will mention at the end also a bit more about the exam, which is going to take place on Wednesday, right in here, uh, which is going to consist of multiple choice questions. All right, so to begin with then, let's talk about the basic wiring of the uh, visual system that we had covered. And that uh, is outlined here for the, for the primate and for the human. Uh, and I, I should mention as I had done in the initial lecture, that this is different from many of the lower level species in which the two eyes look sideways. And each eye sends all of its retinal ganglion cell axons across to the other hemi hemifield in the brain. Now, this big change occurred when the eyes moved to the front. And we had discussed already why that may have happened. And as a result of this, uh, if you imagine cutting your eye vertically in half, you divide it into nasal and temporal hemiretinae. And it so happens that the nasal hemiretina of one eye and, and the temporal retina of the other eye goes to one side, and the obverse happens to the other side. The connections are made to several areas. Most notably for our purposes was the lateral geniculate nucleus, but also the superior colliculus and several other structures that we had talked about that include the accessory optic system. Once the connections come up to the cortex, several cortical areas, we'll talk about that in a minute, uh, uh, have evolved that uh, are involved in progressively higher levels of uh, visual analysis. Now this circle here, uh, hopefully you guys remember, is the, uh, either called the Wieth-Müller circle or it's called the Horopter. And it was shown by a clever experimentalist that if you put any spot along that circle, when the person fixes, fixes it in, at this point of the circle, all of those points impinge on corresponding points in the two uh, retinae. However, if there's an object that's either be, be beyond or closer to the eye than the circle, then they hit non-equivalent points uh, in the retina. And that non-equivalency is actually used for depth perception, as we have discussed, and I will mention again uh, when it comes to uh, uh, stereopsis. So that is the very, very basic wiring arrangement. And then if you proceed from here and look at the retina and the lateral geniculate nucleus in a bit more detail, first starting with the retina, I want to point out to you, first of all, that there are two different kinds of photoreceptors. You all know this very well by now. You knew this even before you came to class. Uh, you have the rods and the cones. You have three basic types of uh, cones, red, green, and blue, uh, which 
most, more appropriately, I refer to short, medium, and long wavelength selective cones. And then we have the rods. Now, uh, what happens is that the light comes in, uh, in this case from the bottom. If you look at yourself, the light comes in, and it goes through many of the cells in the retina, and it impinges on the receptors, which are facing away from, light, from the light against the pigment epithelium. And as I had mentioned to you, uh, there have been some interesting questions as to why this strange arrangement had emerged. Nobody had predicted that before we had the, any anatomy. Uh, people just thought if there were any receptors, they would face the light. So that's certainly a strange arrangement, unusual one. And a lot of speculations had, had been advanced as to why this has happened. And I will just briefly mention two of those. One is that when these photoreceptors are right against the pigment epithelium, which in uh, uh, diurnal animals uh, is black and absorbs uh, the uh, photons, thereby preventing scattering of light, as a result of which you can gain high acuity. Uh, and that is known by the fact that if you uh, assess the visual capacities of albinos who don't, don't have a black pigment epithelium because they lack pigment, that's the definition of being an albino, those people have very poor vision because the photons come into the eye and they scatter all over the place and activate many photoreceptors rather than just of those uh, which the uh, incoming photon would hit directly. So that is the arrangement for these. Um, another factor which I don't think I may have may not have mentioned is that uh, what you have in these uh, um, photoreceptors are little packets. If you talk about the rods in particular, you have little packets, each of which has uh, uh, the molecules which uh, are sensitive to the incoming light. And uh, each of these packets, there are about a thousand packets in each of these rods. Okay, and each of those thousand packets has about 10,000 molecules. So we're talking about gigantic numbers. Now what happens is that given this thousand of about a thousand um, packets, they are not there for your life. What happens is that the packets uh, gradually disintegrate and get replaced by a new one. Um, it's about once every 10 days. You lose a packet and you gain a new one. Now that means that some of this stuff gets sloughed off. And one of the reasons people think that the uh, photoreceptors ended up facing away from the light is that they could be close to this inner part of the retina where anything that's sloughed off can be absorbed rather than being just thrown in, 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 into, into the eye itself, into the vitreous. Because if that were to happen over many, many years, uh, the vitreous would become cloudy and you couldn't see. So those are two possible reasons why this strange arrangement has evolved. And you see this in virtually all species. There are just a few species that have, uh, and mo most of those are actually in the sea, uh, who have um, photoreceptors that face towards the light. All right, and then if you proceed here, the other amazing thing that had been discovered is that uh, all the photoreceptors hyperpolarize to light. Again, they do the opposite of what people had thought. You'd think when, when photons come in, they would uh, activate the photoreceptors, and they would send a signal down uh, the, uh, the stream through the eye. Now, it turns out the opposite happens, that uh, the discharge of the neurotransmitter here occurs when there is a darkening rather than an increase in light. That's an important factor to remember. Uh, that's true for all the photoreceptors. All photoreceptors hyperpolarize to light. You know this well already. I must have said that by ten, 10 times by now. Now, the amazing thing is that when you come to the bipolar cells, the next set of receptors here, it was discovered that two basic types, there are several different types, like for, for the midget parasol cells, but there are uh, two basic types, the on and the off. And this is accomplished by having uh, two kinds of uh, synapse 
synapses in the, in the on and off bipolar cells, sign conserving ones and sign inverting ones. All right? This is accomplished in the on bipolars by virtue of the MGLUR6 uh, receptor site and uh, the MGLUR1 and 2 for the off bipolar cells. So that means now that you have signals in some of these cells when there's an increase in light and the signals in some where there's a decrease in light. So uh, that's the situation for the on and off bipolars. And then when you come to into the uh, uh, level of the uh, ganglion cells, two major classes of ganglion cells are the on and the off. Now I'll talk about that in more detail in just a minute. Now the other interesting, curious thing is that when you look at the uh, rods, the rods, uh, and they connect to their, to their um, bipolar cells. They are all sign inverting synapses. They only come in one type, at least in humans and in primates. So <coughs> what happens then to create on and off, it's actually done in the inner retina by virtue of having a, a synapse here, the A2-emocrine cell, which is a glycinergic synapse. and it, also makes connection with the on bipolar, which is a gap junction. And this way it becomes a double-ended system for the rods as well as for the cones. So hopefully you guys all remember this. I know it's complicated, uh, but that is something that one doesn't have a choice about. That's how it simply is. All right, so now we move on, and we're going to look at the lateral geniculate nucleus. Here's a cross-section of it I had shown you before. Uh, it was discovered that the lateral geniculate nucleus uh, in central retina, this is a monkey retina. The human is, is very similar. So uh, in, in input from a monkey retina to the uh, lateral geniculate nucleus. And the six layers consist of two major types, the uh, parvocellular, so-called the magnocellular layers. And what was discovered is that the parvocellular layers get input from the midget cells that we'll talk about in just a minute. And the uh, bottom two layers, uh, which are the magnocellular layers, get input from the parasol cells. And then what happens is that when you go from central vision to peripheral vision, you have a huge change in the relative percentage of midget and parasol cells that uh, you have in the retina and in the lateral geniculate nucleus. In the, near, the, near the fovea, in the foveola itself, you don't have any parasol cells. But as in, in the fovea itself, you do. And there's a ratio of about 8 to 1. And then as you go to the periphery, eventually they're equal in number. So there's a huge emphasis on uh, the midget system in central vision and a, and a much increased emphasis on uh, the parasol cells in peripheral vision. So that's the arrangement there. And this is reflected in the geniculate, which has six layers in central vision and um, out to about 18 degrees. And it has four layers in the periphery where the midget and parasol cell inputs are pretty much equal as reflected by these four layers. So that's the basic arrangement then for the lateral geniculate nucleus. Now if you move on, um, let me say one more thing. The receptive field properties of cells in the retina, in the retinal ganglion cells, I should say, and in the lateral geniculate nucleus are highly similar. They're virtually identical. All right? You have circular receptive fields with center surround antagonism. All right, now if you move on and move up to the visual cortex, what happens is that uh, uh, there's a huge change that arises. The beautiful discoveries made by Hubel and Weasel, for which they had received the Nobel Prize. And this is just a quick view of the monkey brain. Here is area V1. I'll, t I'll come back to the other areas in a minute. The nice thing about this in the monkey is that this area is lysencephalic, as I had told you. And because of that, it's easy to study the cells uh, and their properties uh, in area V1. All right, so now if one uh, examines the properties of single cells in area V1, it was discovered some major transformations had occurred. Uh, in the input from the lateral geniculate nucleus. And these major transforms can be summarized in just a second. Uh, but I will first tell you that 
there is a differential input from the parvocellular and magnocell layers, which project respectively to 4C beta and 4C alpha. And then there's yet another class of cells that originates in the retina uh, that, are the inter that project into the interlaminar layers, and they project to the upper portions of the, uh, of the visual cortex. So now if one looks in detail at the properties of these cells, which we had discussed in, uh, quite a bit, we can refer to these as transforms, the transforms of the visual input into the, into the cortical cells. So when you record from these cortical cells, you find one big transform is the, that these cells, the overwhelming majority of these cells, become orientation selective. Many cells become direction selective, uh, virtually all simple cells, and about half the complex cells. So direction selectivity becomes very important. We'll talk about that in a bit more detail later on. Then some cells are spatial frequency selective. Many cells get an input from both eyes. And there is a convergence of input from the on and off channels. This is also true for some of the cells that get a convergent input from the midget and parasol cells. So those are the major transforms that uh, you see in the visual cortex. All right, so now, uh, as a result of having made these discoveries, people came up with the question of how is this organized in the visual cortex? And the first point that I had made is that uh, there's a topographic layout of the visual field in visual cortex, uh, but with much more area allocated for central vision than peripheral vision, simply copying the relative percentage of cells already in the retina that exist in central vision and peripheral vision. Uh, and because the thickness of the gray matter in cortex is about two millimeters, roughly, uh, and it's constant, more space has to be allocated for central vision than peripheral vision. And as a result of this, people had studied the spatial arrangement and organization of the visual cortex. And the initial model that was proposed, if you remember, is the Hubel and Weasel model, according to which in one direction you have the alternation of red, left and right eyes. You have columns, left, right, left, right, left, right. And in the other direction, you have a systematic change in the orientation of cells. Now, this model didn't fare that well because it's not as neat as has been proposed. An alternative model was the radial model. And the last one I'm showing here, which I call the swirl model, is not really a model because some very clever experiments that have been carried out by Blaisdell uh, actually did optical recording and demonstrated that, it, that the visual cortex from the top looks something like this, where you have indeed systematic arrangement of orientations and left and eye, right eye columns. But it's not a straight linear factor, but it's kind of a swirly arrangement. So that then established what is the layout of the primary visual cortex. OK, now the other important thing that uh, we had emphasized is that contrary to some of the popular ideas that people have had, that uh, the cells in the brain are feature selective, meaning they extract specific features from the visual scene. Like, say, one cell extracts color, another cell extracts a particular face, and so on. It turns out that that's a, a false impression that people had gained. And instead, what is happening, that any given one cell <coughs> processes many different kinds of visual information. And it's uh, the activity of thousands and thousands of cells uh, in a network that can come up with uh, the percepts that you perceive. Now, that's extremely complicated, uh, 10 times more complicated than any computer. And uh, it is something that, to a large extent, still has not been solved. We don't know how does a person recognize a face. You can tell that, oh, it takes place in various parts of the brain and so on. But exactly physically how that's done is something that still remains largely a mystery. All right, so now <clears throat> let's move on and talk about exostriate cortex. In exostriate cortex, here's a 
a diagram of the, of the monkey brain again. Now, I'll point out now, here's area V1. Then once you get close to the lunate sulcus here, uh, V2 begins and folds under. And then we, inside there, we have V3. And then actually, when it folds back out again, uh, you have area V4 here. Uh, and then you have areas MT and MST right here. And then in addition, you have, of course, your infratemporal cortex area, which plays a very important role in, in complex analyses such as faces. And then you come to the frontal lobe here, in which you have the frontal eye fields and medial eye fields that also process visual information, but mostly for uh, eye movements that I will talk about later on. So that then is, a, in a nutshell, uh, uh, the arrangement. And much of the work that has been done in the past uh, dozen years or so it was to examine what these extrastriate areas do for vision. And I'll come back to that uh, as when we talk about higher level visual processing. Now basically, the fact is that there are more than 30 visual areas and that there are more than 300 interconnections among them. Initially, the idea was, the feature detection idea, that each of these areas is specific for analyzing a particular type of percept. But then it became more evident, increasingly more evident, that uh, these areas tremendously interact with each other and perform these very complex analyses uh, based on networks uh, being active. Now, the basic major cortical visual areas, V1 I just talked about, V2 I mentioned, V3, V4, MT. Then when you come to the temporal cortex, uh, you come to infra the infratemporal region that I just mentioned. And then in the parietal cortex, we have <coughs> the lateral and parietal sulcus, the ventral interparietal, and the medial superior temporal sulcus. So those are some of the major areas. And then as I've already noted, in, in the frontal cortex, we have the frontal eye fields. And then even uh, we have the medial eye fields, which are not listed here, uh, that also play a role in eye movements, uh, perhaps to a lesser extent in visual analysis as such. But there many of the cells there, too, have visual receptive fields, although they, they are very hard to discern. It's, they much more clearly have motor fields than visual fields. All right, so now what we are going to do is we're going to go back uh, to the beginning and look at the so-called on and off channels briefly. We talked about that a lot. Um, again, to re-emphasize, all photoreceptors hyperpolarize to light. And then, because the two types of two major classes of uh, neurotransmitter receptor sites in the bipolar cells, you create a double-ended system from a single-ended one, creating the so-called on and off. Now, these systems were discovered initially by Kefra Hartline, who received the Nobel Prize for that remarkable discovery. And he thought at the time that the on system signaled when a stimulus came on, and the off channel signaled when it went off. That was his idea, which turned out to be all wrong, uh, because that's not what these cells are about. What these cells are about, as I've pointed out repeatedly, is that they can process both uh, light increment and light decrement with an excitatory response. That means because of the nature, the physical nature of light, that some objects in the world re reflect light and some objects in the world uh, absorb light. And so those, uh, because of this, as you look around, some objects look black and some objects look white or whatever. And because of that, to be able to rapidly process something that is a dark object as well as a light object, you need to have excitatory signals to go to the central nervous system to process that. So therefore, we can say, first of all, that we have these cell types, and they all have sensors around antagonism. And let me add one more fact here is that they'll come to with adaptation, that uh, the average firing rate, ma average maximum firing rate of a retinal ganglion cell is, is, I don't know, maybe about four to 600 hertz, all right? And that is a rather limited frequency range, and yet you have to analyze uh, practically over 10 log units of, of light information. 
And because of that, the center surround antagonism has evolved so that these cells always look at uh, <coughs> local contrast changes rather than absolutes. So then, if you look at the on and off cells, I've told you, in, in accordance with the center surround antagonism, if you put a small spot in the light in the center of the receptive field, on cells fire when you increase it, off cell fires when you decrease it. But when you use a much larger spot, you get a lesser response because of the surround antagonism. So that's the basic principle of these two types of cells. And then I told you about these experiments in which 2 amino 4 phosphonobutyrate had been used, which is for brief purposes called APB. And I've told you about two types of experiments, one doing single cell recordings in various parts of the brain, and the other is to do behavioral studies. And what the single cell recordings had shown is that, uh, well, let me, f let me first say that the, what APB does. APB is what? Anybody remember? It's a neurotransmitter analog. And what neurotransmitter is it? Very good, glutamate. All right, so what you do is when you inject this substance into the eye, this is an artificial substance, uh, it blocks the on cells from being able to respond to incoming light, but does nothing to the off cells. All right, so if you do this, and study the responses of single neurons in various parts of the brain. There have been all these different hypotheses as to um, <coughs> why we have the on, on and off channels. One of them was to create sensor surround antagonism. Uh, and uh, the other another one was to create or orientation and direction selectivities in the cortex. Well, it turned out that when you injected APB in, into the eye, and you blocked the on channel, the off input to these cells, and the off cells, therefore, uh, still had sensor surround antagonism. And the cells in the cortex still had orientation and direction selectivities. So these two systems did not arise for the purpose of creating those basic <coughs> attributes, which are so central for being able to analyze the visual scene. Now, the second important finding was that when you did a behavioral study, and asked monkeys to detect light increment and detect light decrement, there was a huge deficit in detecting light increment, but no deficit in detecting light decrement. So these observations and many other studies analyzing why we have on and off channels uh, came up with the conclusion, which I think is quite valid, that these two systems have evolved to, be, uh, to enable organisms to quickly respond to both a light decremental and light incremental input. And you probably remember the little, quick little movie I showed you that you have a fish in the ocean. Fish also have on and off channels, of course. If there's a, uh, a bird in the sky, like an osprey, that is seen by virtue of light decrement, your off system tells that fish, oh, there's a bird up there, and so it can escape. And if you have a predator from below that is, is lit up by the sunshine, uh, the on system responds to that and enables this fish to escape. So that's sort of one example of uh, the function, the prime function of the on and off channels. All right, so that's the basic fact then. So we, to conclude then, the on and off channels have emerged in the course of evolution to enable organisms to proceed process both light incremental and light decremental information rapidly and effectively, OK? So that's the conclusion then, uh, in a nutshell, of the on and the off channels. Now we can move on and look at the so-called midget and parasol cells that had been discovered uh, initially in the cat, and they were called the X and Y cells. Uh, in the Monkey, it's called midget and parasol because when you look at them anatomically, the midget cells are small and have very small dendritic arbors, where the parasol cells are much bigger and have much larger dendritic arbors that look like an umbrella. 
So those two systems were discovered, and statistical analysis revealed that they are totally separate types of cells. They're not a continuum. So the question then became, why did these two systems evolve? And why did nature go to such trouble as to make sure that they were separate in the retina and separate in the geniculate of the monkey? Uh, and then in the cortex, sometimes it remains separate, and sometimes the two systems remain separate, and sometimes they converged, as I had noted, in those transforms in area V1. All right, so now, if you look at that, you've seen this several times now. The midget system, the center in central retina, consists of just a single cone. And therefore, this system should be able to tell you about color, whereas the parasol system has mixed inputs bo both in the center and the surround. Furthermore, the parasol system responds much more transiently than the midget system. So temporal information uh, can be processed effectively, more effectively by the parasol system than the midget system. So those were the initial uh, observations at the single cell level. And then behavioral studies were carried, carried out in which either the, the midget or the parasol system were selectively blocked. And then performance was tested uh, where those systems had been blocked and where the systems were intact. And when this was done, uh, some major findings emerged. Before I tell you about that, let me just reiterate again what these connections are. Uh, here we have the midget and parasol cells as well as uh, the cornea cellular cells. They project through the geniculate up to the visual cortex. And then from there, there have been lots of debates as to what is the nature of the connections to higher areas in the brain. And we talked about that quite a bit. And some beautiful studies had been carried out showing that the input, the area empty in the parietal lobe, is dominated by the parasol system. But the input to V4 and the temporal lobe is about equal for the two systems. So that was the basic factor then. And so now the question then comes up, what is the contribution of these two systems, the midget and the parasol? And so experiments were carried out where lesions were made in either in parvocellular or magnocellular geniculate. And then the monkey was tested, as I've said, in intact areas, in areas where the midget system, in areas where the parasol system had been blocked. <coughs> now, one additional fact is that when you block both of these by lesion in the lateral geniculate nucleus, for the most part, the monkey becomes blind. Okay? So these two systems are really central for being able to process visual information. All right, so now, if one looks at what kinds of deficits arise, a monkey can be trained on a whole bunch of different tasks. We talked about these. Color vision, texture perception, pattern perception, shape perception, brightness, coarse scotopic vision, contrast sensitivity, stereopsis, motion perception, flicker perception. Talk about those first. So it was found that uh, there was a severe deficits after a parvocellular parvo lesion, okay, meaning when the midget system was blocked in color vision, in texture perception, pattern perception, and shape perception, also in contrast sensitivity and severe in stereopsis. None of those uh, caused a deficit uh, with a magnocellular lesion, meaning eliminating the parasol system. But when uh, one examined motion perception and flicker perception, there was a major deficit, moderate to major deficit, uh, where that system was missing. So that then established, I'll come back to these later, uh, established, at least in some people's mind, why these two systems have emerged in the course of evolution. And so a summary statement to that effect is shown here. If you look at the, the ability to process spatial frequency by the midget and parasol system, the midget system can process it up to much higher spatial frequencies. Okay? The obverse is the case when it comes to temporal frequencies. The parasol system can process to much higher levels of, uh, like of, of rapid motion or flicker, as you can see in this little diagram. So the midget system extends the range of vision uh, in the spatial frequency and wavelength range, and the parasol system extends it in the temporal frequency range. So that's why these two systems have evolved. And then if you look at this, um, 
in terms of the relative number of cells in the retina that are devoted to these two attributes. I told you that in the foveola, uh, there are just, there's no input at all to the parasol system. So therefore, what are this fine vision that uh, the fovea uh, makes possible for you is due to the fact that that area is dominated by the midget system. And then as you go progressive to the periphery, that ratio changes, as I had just shown you, because increased emphasis has to be placed on seeing motion and rapid changes in the periphery. So that's what happens uh, with the uh, <coughs> parasol systems, increased number of cells in the periphery that can handle that requirement. Okay, so now we're going to move on and talk about various aspects of visual processing, and we'll start first with color vision and adaptation. As I'd shown you before, one of the beautiful uh, advances that had been made initially, actually, believe it or not, by Newton, I mentioned that, I think, uh, was the discovery of, well, I shouldn't say discovery, the invention of the color circle. Now, this invention arose in part because it was, was established it's a well-known fact that we don't have uh, opposites along these axes. You don't have a yellowish-blue color. You don't have a reddish-green color. But anything that's not an opposite in this color circle, you do have. Okay? So you have yellowish-red, or you have yellowish-green, and so on. So the color circle was then elaborated upon over many years. This is a slightly uh, modified version from what Newton had invented. And this is set up in such a fashion that when you go around this circle, OK, I should say disk, I suppose, uh, you change the hue, of course. And then when you go from the center to the periphery, you increase saturation. And this is not the perfect uh, display, especially because the uh, projector isn't perfect. But the center is supposed to be white. And this is, all this is fairly equiluminant, and so you go from unsaturated to saturated. Now, I will say already at this point another very important factor in um, appreciating the beauty of the um, color circle is that when you analyze after images, it was found that if you adapt for, to say, to something that's yellow, you adapt the eye to this wavelength here, and then you shift it to white, then you get an after effect, which is blue. And if you do that for red, the after effect is green, and all, the same thing is all the way around the circle. If you have this one, the after effect is here. So the color circle perfectly predicts what your after images are uh, due to adaptation. Which, is, which occurs as a result of having um, bleached selectively uh, the um, molecules in the various cone types that we have, the three cones, red, green, and blue. So that's the basic rule of the color circle, which can be used extensively. And I think you yourself can have a lot of fun studying this uh, in, in your off time, <laughs> that you don't have too much, I'm sure. But it's really a, a, a wonderful thing to play around with. All right, so now, since this course is rather, rather heavily fact-oriented, I want you to remember these basic facts that um, um, I had listed before. As just noted, along the uh, color circle, you have three attributes. Hue, brightness, and saturation. And then I also mentioned to you that there is a distinction between the psychological and the physical attribute of uh, images. And this arrangement is such that, you, uh, that I gave you an example of. For example, when a tree falls in the forest, is there a sound when there's nobody around? And the answer is 
a distinctive no. Why? Because sound is a psychological attribute. If you, on the other hand, you'd have said, well, when a tree falls in the forest, do some wavelength um, um, result that are in the range of hearing. And that, of course, is a yes. But if you say, say sound, that's what something you hear. It's not something is, is a physical thing. So that, uh, that um, applies to many aspects of, uh, of vision as well as audition and many other senses, that you must make a distinction between what your uh, psychological disposition is as opposed to what a physical fact is. OK, now the next thing here is that we have three types of photoreceptors, a short, medium, and long wavelength. Uh, for the cones, and then we have also the, a different wavelength peak for the rods. All of these peaks are broadly tuned to enable you to, uh, somewhere in, in the brain, examine the relative amounts of information from these three wavelengths. That then enables you to perceive many, many other colors, um, partly because of color opponency, and partly because of the relative amount of activity of them. And then I mentioned Grassmann's laws. Every color has a complementary, which, when mixed properly, yields gray. And that you do with the, uh, again, with the color circle. So in other words, to go back to that, if you mix the yellow and blue in equal amounts, you get white, or gray, I should say. And the same thing for anything that's on opposites. But then if you mix things which are not at, at, uh, at, at uh, diagonals to each other, then you get an in-between color. So if you mix, mix yellow and green, you get yellowish green. All right, so that's Grassmann's laws, OK? So if you have non-complementary colors, you get intermediates. And you get complementary colors, you get gray. Now again, to make sure that you understand this, uh, Complementary means this and that, this and that, this and that, okay? Which are on the opposites on the uh, uh, lines that intersect the center of the uh, color circle. Okay, so now we move on and we talk about Abney's law. That, that is not very important, and you don't have to remember that. The luminance of a mixture of differently colored lights is equal to the sum of the luminance of its components. That's, that's another fact, but you don't need to know that. Uh, the last thing here that I want to mention is so-called metamers, okay, which are stimuli which uh, uh, look the same, but are the product of different subcompositions uh, of wavelengths. So because we only have three uh, different cone photoreceptors, you can, in a sense, if you will, fool them a little bit by very carefully mixing things up with different wavelengths to act activate them equally. So that's what, what, is, what is called a metamere, when you can not tell the difference between, between two stimuli. Uh, they look identical, even though the wavelength compositions are different. OK, so now another factor that I should note here when it comes to color vision is that when you uh, Look at the response characteristics of cells in the, in the retina, and I'm talking about the retinal ganglion cells, or we look at the cells in the geniculate, which is here. What you find, actually, is, two, is just a few major categories. This is the color circle here. And one presents these stimuli around the circle and see how the cell responds. And what you see here is one cell, which is a blue on cell, a green off cell, a yellow on cell, and a green on cell. Okay? Now it turns out, if you record from hundreds and hundreds of cells, you only get these categories. You don't ever get any cells which are at the diagonals. So to see the diagonals, something has to be taking place in the cortex on the basis of what is coming in from the retina and the lateral geniculate nucleus. OK, now when we come to adaptation, we talked about that quite a bit. And also with after images, I'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, it was discovered, it's a very nice example, that you take a cell and you adapt it to various levels of overall illumination. 
and then see how the cell responds and when you stimulate the receptive field. What you find is that here's, this is the same cell. Here's a background illumination of a huge range of a, uh, five log units, OK? And what you find is when once the cell is adapted, it responds always the same. So it's looking not at over all le levels of illumination. It's looking at differences in illumination. It's looking at contrast. Now, how many of you remember the formula for contrast? Anybody? All right. I think that's a, that's a really good thing to remember. I'm sure when you go to a party, people will be fascinated by you knowing the formula for contrast. OK, so contrast equals, you take the stimulus, which is colored x, OK? And you take the background, which you call y. You subtract one from the other. And then you add the two up. And then you multiply this by 100, OK? So that's your contrast. But this means, this formula means that this applies to endless levels of il overall illumination. You can do this in the sunshine. You can do it in the moonshine, OK? Because you're looking at the differences between the background and the uh, stimulus itself. Sorry? What is x and y? As I've said, x is the illumination level for the, for the target. Suppose you take a cell and you shine a spot of light in on it, OK? Like that. All right? Then you remove it and you measure the background level. And so x is a visual stimulus, y is the background. OK? All right, now uh, we talk about light adaptation. I again want you to know a few basic facts. Uh, the overall level of illumination is close to 10 log units, OK? But in contrast to that, if you just look at reflected light, that varies over a much smaller range because under very bright illumination conditions, even a black object will reflect some light. So we're talking about direct light versus reflected light. So when you do reflected light, you get a smaller range. Now the pupil plays a role in the amount of light it controls getting into the eye. But it can only do that over a range of 16 to 1. Now, because of that, a major role of adaptation has to do with the uh, <coughs> photoreceptors in your rods and in your cones. And the way that works is, if you remember, is that uh, you can think of your, your uh, molecules in your photoreceptors as existing in two forms, bleached and unbleached. And because of the millions and millions of them, the, I told you already about, 1,000 times 10,000 in just a single cone. Uh, there's a relative percentage of bleached and unbleached uh, cells, uh, molecules, I should say, uh, in each cone and in each rod. <coughs> and so what is happening is that during dark adaptation, there's a huge increase in the unbleached. And during light adaptation, there's an increase in the bleached molecules, all right? So therefore, uh, any increase in the rate of, at which quanta are delivered to the eye results in a proportional decrease in the number of pigment molecules available to absorb those quanta. Retinal ganglion cells are selective, sensitive to local contrast differences, not absolute levels of illumination. I've said that many times over again. Okay? And that's why this formula, this contrast formula, is one that's uh, the most useful in being able to depict uh, what kind of input these cells are getting. So that then is the arrangement uh, uh, about light adaptation. <clears throat> now, let's move on to depth perception, which is one of the most intriguing capacities that we have, since our retinae are essentially like a two-dimensional surface. So whatever comes onto the retina, some mechanisms have to 
be able to tell you where things are in depth. And because it's such a complex problem, quite a number of different mechanisms have evolved to make it possible for you to do that. And that means that, first of all, we have ocular motor cues. We don't need to talk about those. But we have visual cues, which have the binocular cue is stereopsis. We talked about quite a bit. And the monocular cues are motion parallax, shading, interposition size, and perspective. All these cues we can utilize to tell us where things are in depth. So now, if we uh, look at stereopsis, I've handed out to you some of these autostereograms. If you look at these, you can't see it looking at that. We have to do it on, 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 on those sheets that I handed out to you. You can see something in depth. And this arises by virtue of the fact that uh, the stimuli are in such a fashion that it sel they selectively activate neurons in the visual cortex that code depth by virtue of the fact that they get disparity inputs from the two eyes. Now, uh, another central mechanism, I should add one more thing about stereopsis. I think I've mentioned that 5 to 10% of the population in the United States lacks stereopsis in most cases due to uh, either misalignment of the two eyes, okay, or due to amblyopia, meaning one eye is, uh, is, it doesn't see as well as the other. But those people can still do many things and do depth quite well. They can't thread needles, but, but they can do coarser depth quite well. And one of those is due to motion parallax. Now, the basic rule about motion parallax that uh, caused the brain to evolve to analyze it is that when objects are different distances from the eye, as depicted here, the objects that are closer to the eye, when this object moves, move, uh, moves over a greater range on the retinal surface than those that are further apart. You can see the green versus the, the red. So therefore, uh, the um, system is such that it has evolved to be able to see small differences in the relative motion of <coughs> objects on the retinal surface. And I, I showed you an example of that. I'll show it to you again because this is fun. Uh, this is uh, essentially similar to the random dot stereogram, except it's just a single bunch of uh, random dots. And as soon as I set this in motion, you see them in three dimensions beautifully because these move over a greater range than these. And these move even less so. So this differential motion uh, commands you to see it in depth. So that's quite a, quite a remarkable ability. And monkeys said this is uh, 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 even better at it than we are. And even fish have this kind of capacity, as do many, many other species. It's so central to our ability to process depth. OK, then um, studies have been carried out to determine uh, where and how uh, these are analyzed. And when it came to where, here's an example of looking at a brain in normal and a stereoblind subject uh, when you only present motion parallax, you only present stereo. And when you do the stereo uh, monocularly, you, you don't see depth. And the brain is not active. So this tells you which part of the brain, the posterior part of the brain, is active and in involved analysis of uh, stereopsis and which ones involved in the analysis of motion parallax. I showed you this picture and several others telling you which areas it is. The limitation of that is that um, it can tell you where it takes place in the brain, but doesn't tell you how it takes place. So because of that, many studies have been carried out doing single cell recordings in these cortical areas. And it was discovered that there are indeed cells already in area 17 that get disparate input from the two eyes. Uh, beautiful work uh, by Poggio showing this. And established, therefore, that already in area 17, you have neurons that tell you about stereoscopic depth. Uh, and then it was also discovered, especially in uh, area MT, to a lesser extent already in V1 also, that you have cells that respond to differential motion. And so those cells are presumptively involved in the processing of depth information based on uh, motion parallax.
Now another mechanism involved that we talked about is shading. Light coming from above, like from the sun, uh, had been co incorporated into the visual system to tell you whether an object is, is, is towards you or away from you. And this is an example of that. Here the light is from above and the dark is, darkness is below. This is reversed here. And because of that, you see this as protruding and you see this as receding. And so I showed you several examples, some in the handout, of the fact that even shading is a cue that's used quite extensively in uh, uh, depth perception. OK, now we come to form perception. I'll talk about this briefly. I mentioned three kinds of theories. One is that uh, form is due to the fact that neurons respond selectively in line segments of different orientations in V1. Another theory was that uh, they have a spatial mapping of the stimuli onto the visual cortex, since you have topography. And the third one is that form perception is accomplished by Fourier analysis. We talked about each of these, and I pointed out to you that even when there are no orientation segments in this display, you can still see uh, and identify faces quite well, as seen in, um, uh, in the uh, Wall Street Journal, where these kinds of pictures appear every day in the paper itself. Now, then if you move on and you look at the layout of how the cortex, this is a monkey cortex here, this is a visual field. If you present these three stimuli in the visual field, this is the area that's activated in the cortex because more area is allo allocated to central vision and peripheral vision. And so you say, well, this is much bigger than those. But that's not the case. You can tell that they're identical. Now, even more dramatic is the fact that if you put these three disks centered, OK, so half of it goes to the ypsilateral, uh, ha ha half of it goes to the ypsilateral, and half of it to the contralateral uh, visual hemifield, what you get are a bunch of half circles like that. And it doesn't look anything like that. So the idea that somehow images are laid down the visual cortex and the mind then looks at it is totally wrong. It's, it's, it's wrong to the extent that it's ridiculous. The last theory, the Fourier th uh, analysis theory, uh, is accepted by some people. And that doing computer analyses has revealed that that system actually can be mimicked extremely well based on what we know about the organization of the uh, visual cortex. It has all the basic attributes that you need, orientation, dire selectivity, direction selectivity, and phase that enable you to break down the visual scene in an analytical fashion, which is kind of foreign to our thinking, namely Fourier analysis. OK. Then we spent some time talking about prosthesis, which you're going to hear quite a bit about, actually, when uh, Chris Brown is going to lecture, because that has been so successful in uh, the auditory system uh, with the cochlear implant, uh, which is a remarkable achievement. We have more than 50,000 people, many more than 50,000 by now, in the United States who have cochlear implants. And they can talk and do, do all kinds of remarkable things. We don't have this in the visual system. Um, and I've mentioned to you that one of the big differences is that in the retina, there, there are more than a million fibers in each eye that come from the ganglion cells that project into the, into the, uh, uh, into the brain. Whereas when you talk about the, the auditory system, you only have about 30,000 uh, fibers. So the magnitude is much less. But also there are other factors, namely the retina is a very difficult structure to work with. And also when people become blind, in, mo excuse me, in most cases, uh, the retina degenerates. So you can't put uh, a device into the eye very effectively in most blind people to uh, create vision. So another alternative is to try some other regions. Some people have advocated to do this in the visual cortex. And the problem there is that we have the huge magnification factor. So if you put uh, 256 stimuli like this, in the visual scene, this is the actual physical activation. Okay? And once you know what this layout is, then you can put electrodes in, which are spaced like this. And if you were to stimulate these, then you would 
create an image which is at least moderately similar to this. They would be in slightly different colors, uh, washed out colors, uh, but which would still essentially be a square. So if you do that then, and you take a camera, and you take uh, the input to the camera and connect it selectively to this uh, proportional implant, if you put the word fiat lux there, remember what that is, let there be light, you get a pretty good reproduction of what has been put in there. But by contrast, if you take a, an uh, array of electrodes that are equally spaced, then if you activated all those, you would get a butterfly image. And if you then put in the fiat lux to the camera, it would look like that. So that would mean that you would get a pretty false impression of the world, and you wouldn't be able to even read. So therefore, uh, it would be very important to take into account the functioning of the visual system, as well as the functioning of the individual neurons, uh, to, uh, if you're going to create a prosthetic device. All right, so now uh, I will move on, and I will say a few words about illusions. We talked about quite a few illusions, and got some of those in the handout. The one I mentioned to you that uh, I think all of you enjoyed is the Herman grid illusion, which shows those smudges at the intersections. And the famous theory that was advanced by Baumgartner is that it's due to the fact that uh, if, if, if you have a cell that is centered and surround here, as opposed to uh, not at the intersections, th this cell would be inhibited more than this one. So this hypothesis had been uh, accepted by many people a few years back, and uh, it has appeared in many, many textbooks. Well, it turns out this theory is all wrong, if you remember, because first of all, uh, here you just make a small change in the uh, physical layout of the, of the lines, and you don't get the effect at all, even though if, if you put, it, put uh, a cell here, as opposed to here, the arrangement is still the same. So consequently, that theory is wrong. And it's even further proven by the fact that when you analyze it physically to see what the number of cells is in, in this area here, this is for the parasol cells, and this is for the midget cells. You have a huge number of cells. And this is shown only for the on cells. You can double that uh, for. Uh, the off cells, you would activate in this little teeny area here, five degrees from the, f from the fixation, you would activate 600, 365 midget cells and 50 parasol cells. Okay, Half of which would be on and half of which would be off. So um, th this theory is, is, is just incorrect. And so alternative ideas have been developed still uh, sort of under debate. And one is that this takes place because of the simple cells in the visual cortex as we have talked about it. Now then, uh, another set of illusions we talked about are the after effect illusions. And the experiment that we sort of informally did here is if you look at a particular display, you fix it for a while. And then you change the display, you have an after effect, a very dramatic after effect. And one of those was that rotating uh, dots in, in the circle. <clears throat> and I showed to you that experiment was that you would adapt to with one eye, and then you would look at the display afterwards with the other eye, and then you would have no effect, which proves that this takes place in the retina and proves that it's due to the adaptation that place, takes place in the photoreceptors. All right, so that, those were the so-called interocular experiments we had discussed. All right, so now let me move on and talk some more about the lesions that arise when you make, sorry, the deficits in, in vision arise as a, as a function of lesions. And I already showed you a whole set of those when we talked about um, lesions of the midget and the parasol systems. And now if you look at this in more detail, we add to this uh, what happens when you remove V4 and remove MT. And it's quite striking that the deficits are far, far less than when you take out the, uh, the midget system. Uh, we, have we have very mild deficits with V4 lesions for most of these up here. 
These are, these are, these are basic visual capacities. Uh, but MT lesions do give you pretty much the same deficits as uh, a magnocellular lesion that blocks the parasol system. Now then, when higher level visual capacities were not analyzed, I've shown you those two as well, you found that there were some uh, dramatic deficits with V4 lesions uh, when, people, uh, when monkeys had to choose lesser stimuli and had to learn visual percepts, they were severely deficit, they had severe deficits with a V4 lesion. So that suggests that an area like V4 plays a very important role in higher level visual processing. Yes? What does the pronounced mean? Is that? Like pronounced, it means that it's a strong deficit. So but, more than severe? But, but it's not, no, no. It's severe, is, you, you can see by the color also. Severe is the strongest. Pronounced is strong, OK? And moderate is weaker. And mild is mild. <laughs> OK, so now, uh, next I want to turn to eye movement control. And when we do that, uh, I want to remind you that the many cortical areas, as, as well as subcortical areas, that play a significant role in eye movement control. And one way to test this is to electrically stimulate various regions in the brain and see if you get any eye movements. And this happens in many areas. The ones we have here are uh, superior curriculus, of course, we talked a lot about, V1, LIP, uh, the medial eye fields and the frontal eye fields. Now, in, in all but one of these, you get uh, a constant vector saccade at any site where you stimulate, meaning no matter where the eye is looking, when you stimulate, you get a particular vector, OK, as depicted here. The exception to that is the medial eye fields where you have a place code. The result of stimulating any given area is to bring the eye, no matter where the eye is, into that motor field. Now, different regions, obviously, in these areas have different vectors. So that's the basic layout. And then the question arose, uh, how do these get down to the brain stem ocular motor complex that drives the uh, mus eye muscles that we had talked about? Well, the way the experiment was done then is to remove the superior colliculus. And when that was done, what you found was really quite dramatic, namely that you could no longer drive cells from the posterior part of the cortex, but you could still drive them from the anterior part. This led to the idea that you have two major systems in uh, saccadic eye movement generation, the so-called posterior system and the anterior system. And then when people looked at the question of why well, we have these two systems, what do they do? It was discovered that the posterior system is very important for generating quick saccades, especially express saccades, because when you remove the colliculus, you never got an express saccade again. And the anterior system plays a very important role in uh, stimulus selection, okay, and the sequencing of eye movements, because you make so many eye movements in rapid succession, you have to make plans ahead to decide where you're going to look in a sequence. And that was found to be very important for the frontal eye fields. Because when you remove that, there was a major deficit in target selection and in sequencing. So then when this was done, also examined whether, if you remember, the question of uh, what is the role of these various areas when you block inhibition, OK, or you increase inhibition, OK? So we use muscimol and bicuculin to do that, as shown here. And it showed that with v V1, you get a strong interference of both. And you also get a strong deficit in visual discrimination. Because to be able to analyze the visual scene, you need to have interaction between excitation and inhibition, both for eye movements and for visual discrimination. Uh, then with a the frontal eye field lesion, uh, you, you got facilitation, as you did in the colliculus, uh, when you put in bicuculin, okay, which eliminates inhibition. Monkey couldn't help but make saccades. But you got interference with muscimol. LIP had no effect. So that then, in, in a summary, was what we had discussed. And this is something, of course, you need to 
go over again in your, in your notes and in, the, uh, in Stellar and in the assigned reading so that you can remember this for the exam. OK, and then um, I pointed out to you that even though we never think of eye movements, we have an incredible number of structures and a number of tasks to uh, be able to m make each eye movement. We have to select a target. We have to decide what, the, what each, if every time you move our eyes, there are dozens of targets. We have to select one of those. Then we have to decide what they are. Then we have to decide which one to look at and which one not to look at. And then we have to use our system, which is uh, a spatial organization of the motor fields, uh, to eventually generate an eye movement. Now, in reality, then, what happens is that many other systems, I showed you this before, too, many other systems are involved in generation of eye movements, uh, hearing, touch, so on. Uh, and we have generated all sorts of systems to enable to, for you to do this, the so-called anterior and the posterior systems uh, that reach the brain stem uh, through various channels here. This is available to, for you on the uh, internet. It's also available to you on the assigned reading. All right, so now, lastly, we'll turn to motion perception. And when we talk about motion perception, I pointed out to you that in uh, area V1, we have simple cells and complex cells, uh, several different classes of simple cells. And almost all of these cells, if you look at their responses to light increment and light decrement, meaning light edges and dark edges, uh, almost every one of these cells in this is direction selective. And it's also true for most complex, about half the complex cells, maybe more, are also direction selective. So direction selectivity is one of the most central features in the visual system that we use extensively, not just to analyze motion, but also to be able to see depth by virtue of a motion parallax. All right, so now we can say, because all, the, all those little experiments I had shown you, that uh, the parasol system, and because of the lesion experiments, uh, plays a central role in motion analysis. And when we did those experiments with apparent motion, when we uh, moved um, little spots in color or in small differences in shape, uh, Color and small difference in shape didn't matter, indicating that it, the uh, uh, parasol system plays a central role in us seeing apparent motion the way we see it. All right, so now, last very briefly, I'm going to say here is about the accessory optic system, uh, because this is what you're going to be writing about. And I just want to remind you that the bas basic discovery was that in the retina, the cells of Dogiel that feed into the accessory optic system come in three different orient, uh, direction selectivities, as shown here. And that these three direction selectivities correspond to the direction selectivity of the semicircular canals. That's quite a remarkable discovery. Uh, and this then enables the organism through the system, which, by the way, these cells respond to sort of the slow movements. Uh, it, its prime function is to, so they claimed, and I think that's correct, uh, is to stabilize the eye with respect to the world. So when you walk around, what happens is you can still see the world very clearly and you have no blurring because the accessory optic system adjusts the eye uh, to keep it stable with respect to the world out there. And in fact, I can't remember if I told you this story. <coughs> um, Way back, in, way back when, in Germany, when, when uh, some people were treated uh, for, for uh, pneumonia, they used the drug, I forget the name of it right now, uh, that caused um, malfunctioning in the semicircular canals. As a result of that, that system, which coexists with the accessory optic system uh, no longer was able to stabilize the eyes. And so here was this, this guy in, um, in Munich living in a neighborhood where he had lived for many, many years. And he realized that he can't see anything clearly when he's walking on the street. Everything was blurry. And so he said, oh my god, I won't be able to recognize my friend. I won't be able to say hello to them. And so what he learned to do is this. <clears throat> 
Hi, Joe. Like that. He stabilized his head by holding it. Okay? So that highlights for you the fact that th this system of stabilizing the eye but through the accessory optic system plays a very important central role in you being able to move around in the world and being able to analyze the visual scene in spite of the fact that you are moving around. Okay, so the last thing I want to show you, well, first let me, I'm going to show you one more picture, but uh, first let me say a couple of words about the exam again. I've told you the exam is a multiple choice exam, uh, probably something about 100 or so questions. Okay, all, almost all of them deal with basic facts. I, I, mean, sh I should say basic facts. So you got to know your facts. Uh, and what you need to do is read each question, circle the choice, okay? You don't get punished extra for being wrong. If you're wrong, you're wrong. But I'm not going to subtract on top of that uh, a, a, a wrong answer from a right answer, okay? So you choose an answer even if you don't know it for every question. Uh, and you'll have a probability of one in four or maybe one in five of, of, of getting the right answer if, you, if, if you're totally ignorant. So that's what the exam is. It's going to take about an hour or so, hour and a half maybe, depending on how fast you read and how fast you make decisions. And that's going to take place um, this coming Wednesday right in this room. All right, now the last thing I want to show you uh, is, I mean, I seem to be so certain about everything being right and wrong here. I just wanted to tell you one thing, a note of caution. Uh, and the caution is this one here. This is a wonderful uh, sculpture by Naum Cabo, okay? I don't know if you ever heard of Naum Cabo. <clears throat> anyway, this is obviously, you can almost instantly say it's, a, it, it's a, a, an upper body and a face, right? <clears throat> But the fact is that, as I say here, as many scientific hypotheses of brain function appealing, but a far cry from a real McCoy. So we are still groping. And yes, we are a long way from, uh, from phrenology, but still many of the hypotheses and ideas that we have are wrong and are more like a, a cartoon of what it really is like, OK? Uh, and of course, the further up, in my opinion, you go from the retina, the uh, higher the fancifulness of the ideas. At least when it comes to the retina, I think we are reasonably comfortable that we know a lot about the photoreceptors and how they interact. And that's fairly close to the way it really is. Yeah. So, so that may be more like a, 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 f a photograph of Obama. Okay. <laughs> but uh, when it comes to the cortex or higher areas, things are a bit more like that. So that's the end of it then. Thank you very much. And I wish you the best of luck on your exam on Wednesday. <clears throat> no, no, thank, you. thank you. That's very nice. Appreciate it. <clears throat>